before we go into the word today, I'd like for us to say a word of prayer uh, for Brent, Brent Napton. Brent is, uh, is in India right now. As he was leaving Nepal, he and those two other people traveling with him, as they were leaving, uh, when they came through customs, they forgot to stamp in Nepal, they forgot to stamp their passport. So they're stuck in India and have had to, uh, there's a local pastor there that has come because he knew somebody in Canada that he called, Brick called somebody in Canada that knew somebody in, uh, uh, there in, in India. And uh, I've, I've been in that airport there in India where they were stranded and that's, that's not a real fun place to be. But anyway, they are situated in a hotel trying to get out of the country. Uh, flights are full because um, because it's wedding season in India right now, so they can't get a they can't get a flight till probably Thursday. They were going to be they were to leave out this last week. They would have been here. He would have been here by now. So um, let's say a word of prayer, Father. I just lift up Brent to you right now, and and the others that are traveling with him, and I just pray for you to. Uh, to help them. We know that all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord, and we believe that this does as well. We know it's easy to say that on this side of the ocean, but uh, we're just praying that you will give their hearts the joy and the, the release and, and the, uh, the, the faith and the encouragement that all is going to work out well. Uh, as Brent has said, it's better being in a nice hotel than they could have been put into jail and uh, by the fault of uh, somebody at customs. But Lord, we just, we just pray right now that you will lead him and guide him and everything that needs to be done. Open up a way for them to be able to get back even quicker. Open up the airlines, open up the, uh, a flight for them, we pray. We give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Turn to somebody and say, you know, say, I don't care what they talk, what they're saying about you. I love you anyway. Just, just turn to somebody and say, it's one of my favorite sayings. I don't care what the devil says about you. I like you anyway. We're talking about reconciliation, and I, I want to talk today about being a reconciling people, people who reconcile others. And what that means for us to be this. And I, some of this may sound like that we're re reiterating, uh, but I believe that there's a, a, a reason why at this particular time God has laid this uh, upon our hearts uh, because the church is, I believe, in America about to be revived. I, I believe that it's already starting in places and it's amazing well, we've all heard the stories about what's happening in Asbury uh, University, and it's uh, spreading. Uh, one of my favorite theologians is a man by the name of Craig Keener, and I uh, had a conversation on the phone with him one time about 10 or 12 years ago. I didn't realize he teaches at Asbury Seminary, and uh, the Wednesday on February the 8th, when this revival broke out and the worship just continued and the service continued all day, and the service continued, I think, for a, a 10 or 12 days straight uh, with no break whatsoever. I think they've taken a break now to probably clean the bathrooms and repair the furniture. But uh, it's, uh, he, he said that his wife came to him. He was downstairs in his office, and he's, he's uh, working on a book. And he said, uh, she said, you've been praying for revival. What are you doing down here? And I thought that would make a the good title for a book. What are you doing down here? You know, because God is moving. Anyway, he got up and he, he spoke some wonderful things, and reporting about what's taking place. One of my dear friends, uh, Dr. Phil Nordstrom, who is in uh, Tennessee, made a trip with a group of people, and he's all over Facebook sharing things that are taking place. We're excited about that because we believe that there is hope. And for America, those things that we cannot do, but only the Holy Spirit can do. And, and when he works, when an atmosphere is established, 
where people are able to come and we're able to bask in God's presence. Uh, major, major things happen, uh, physically, emotionally, mentally, financially, every part of our lives are touched. I was reading um, a couple of weeks ago, and I wrote down some things. I, today, I'm just sharing with you some thoughts that I have, that I have, uh, I've been pondering. And uh, as you well know, if you're on media at all, you you see the you see the arguments, the frustration with each other, and and everything that is the antithesis of reconciliation taking place. And I just wrote down some of the verbs that are used. Someone was outraged about something. Everybody's outraged because that one's outraged at that one being outraged. Who is in turn outraged at that one? Um, Pushed back, so-and-so pushed back. That's a good one they use a lot because somebody had accused uh, the word stupid showed up quite a bit. People calling people stupid. So-and-so sears so-and-so. Sear, just, just seared them, just, just scorched them. So-and-so, the word scorched came up. So-and-so was scorched because they seared somebody who was stupid, who accused somebody that pushed back, that was outraged, on and on and on. Imbecilic, good term. Obliterated by critics. He was o- obliterated by critics. The audacity, wasn't that a wonderful, the audacity, of it. stunned, on and on and on. There's a scripture that says in Proverbs, the 21st chapter, that every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts And then he says, to do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Well, I've done this, I've done that, I've done this. That gives me the right, that gives me the authority, that gives me the wherewithal to be able to be the obnoxious stinker that I want to be. But the Lord says, Our way is right in our own eyes. I know mine is and yours is. We all are. We're that way. The reason why I believe this is because it's the truth. And the reason why I know it's the truth is because I believe it. I said it. I believe it. That settles it. But the Lord comes along and says, Paul, I'm weighing your heart. And... um, I don't want my heart to be weighed and and found wanting. We all have reason to be offended. If you haven't been offended in the last year, the last month, the last week, the last couple of years, the last five years, then we're going to check you. You're not breathing. You've been offended. There's stuff that offends us all the time. In reconciliation, I think the question has has to be this. What do I do in response to offense, and how do I respond to it? There is a view, a Christian perspective. Uh, I, th- I think that most of us and many of us kind of were exposed to this because uh, when we came to the Lord, we came because we needed it, and we are personally reconciled to him. That puts us, sets us apart from the world, Uh, The Bible calls that term holiness. It leads us to us a life of holiness, which means a life of separation. And that approach is good, but it's incomplete because reconciliation is not just individualistic, God's work with us, but it's also corporate, our work with others and our work with those who are around us. So it's not just reconciliation. When I speak of, well, I'm reconciled with him, that's wonderful. That's the first step. But then it's not individualistic. It is corporate. It's not just focused on me, but it's focused on mission, God's mission to this world, God's mission from the beginning, God's mission when he said to Adam and Eve, take this creation that I have made, oversee it, 
Take care of it. Nurture it. Let it flourish under your care. Spread the beauties of Eden around the world so that it becomes one fabulous garden of many, 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 many millions of people. And then again, because of that failure, he comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, I've called you now to go out. You're going to be the father of many nations. I'm going to bless you, and all of the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through you. Genesis, the 12th chapter. Again, pouring out the blessing. So why did God raise up Israel? Not to set them apart. So as God's chosen ones, they could snub their nose at all of the other creation, but to be the example, to be the the model for what can happen when people are gathered together in his name. And so that's the mission that we're involved in now. He sent his son. When the law wouldn't work, when good teaching wouldn't work, when guidelines would not work, when new voices through the prophets would not work, he sent his son. He came himself. When we talk about reconciliation, we're not talking about a plan, a pattern. We're not talking about a program of evangelism. We're talking about being the presence of God wherever we are. And I don't know about you, but that's a challenge to me sometimes. The other day, I was helping my brother and my sister-in-law at a very difficult time of their life. And toward the end of the day, after seven hours at the hospital with them, I went through and to, to get, get them something to eat. I wasn't hungry. You know, you know how all that stuff just takes hunger out of you. And they not only messed up the order, they wouldn't, I said, okay, they, they wouldn't bring it out to me. So finally, I went to the door and the door was locked. I'm confessing. Is it okay if I confess? You'll feel better after I get through confessing. And when a door like that is locked, it was like 9 o'clock or whatever, they'd already shut the door, and somebody's in there mopping, and he goes, no, we're closed. I said, no, you're not closed. I just put an order in the window. Bring me my food, which he couldn't. He probably said, open the door, you know. And he goes, no, no. So he disappeared. I'm knocking. I'm knocking now. The Bible says, ask, seek, and knock. So now I'm knocking. Um, I won't tell you about the rest of it. I felt badly. I had to apologize. But it aggravated me. And I thought, uh, later on, I thought, okay, I'm teaching on reconciliation. Isn't that wonderful? (laughs) Isn't this wonderful? Ephesians, the second chapter. I'll leave it at that. Do you forgive me? Okay. Who said that? (laughs) Just one. Just one forgave me. But that's okay. I am absolved now. Ephesians is the second chapter, the 11th verse. Therefore, remember that formerly you are Gentiles, you who are Gentiles by birth called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you are separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups, everybody say two groups. One, two groups have become one. He has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. So God has done his job in putting the hostility away. He came and preached peace to you who are afar off, peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access to the Father by the Holy Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners or strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people 
and also members of his household. And that household is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus himself, as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and it rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. In him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Can you say amen to the reading of that word? Jesus has done his part. However reconciliation is understood, we we do understand this, that forgiveness can be one-sided, but reconciliation uh, involves the the will, the mind, the heart of both sides of the division. It cannot be pursued unless all that are participating in the process are willing to come to a different place. So in order to reconcile, God had to come to a different place. He came to a different place through Jesus Christ. What the law and prophets could not do, he did through Jesus. And then he passes this ministry on to us so that we understand that just as Jesus came to a new place, we come to a new place too. We step into a new place, a new place where we take the initiative. Just as Jesus took the first step toward us, we do the same for others. We take the step toward. Matthew, the fifth chapter says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. My first verse, I was four years old, missing my two front teeth. I taught like this, and I would get up and say it. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Children, I couldn't get that children out, children of God. And they all loved that, kind of made fun of me, made me stand up and, and quote it several times so that they could laugh, I guess. But that, I didn't realize even at that time, that was, that was part of my calling. My calling to be a peacemaker. That is my, it's your calling too. We're all called to this. It's kind of like the gift of giving. You know, some people have the gift to give. They, 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 that, that's, that is their gift. That's their motivational uh, intuition of the Holy Spirit to be a giver. But we're all called to give. And we're all called on some level to be peacemakers. But I know that that was something that, that the Lord put deeply in me early on in my, in my life. And I, 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 I would see different factions and I would find myself kind of in the middle trying to bring t- people together. In St. Louis, just got involved um, a whole lot, racial reconciliation. Didn't know what I was doing, just knew that I hated the division. Our church was mul- multiple nations and our church was multiracial. But we were on, in the county, and our, it was predominantly white. And I would find myself so many times sitting in a church service where I was the only white person there. Everyone around me were African American, or, or maybe even other nations, because there were a lot, of, a lot of nations that came together in the predominantly African American churches. I remember one time, sitting there, and the guy was preaching away. He went on to become pretty famous in, in, uh, in, in church circles, but he was preaching away, and then he was mimicking how white preachers preach. And I, I, I wasn't paying a whole lot of attention, so I laughed along with everybody else, and I'm sitting right on the front, right there. I'm about 12 feet from him. And uh, I thought, oh, He's making fun of me. (laughs) I needed that. I needed to see what it was like to be a minority. I needed that. See, I'm not saying I'm anything special. I just believe that I've been called to take that first step. Jesus, while we were yet sinners, came and died for us. So if we were yet sinners, and he did not look at us and say, oh, what putrefying sin I have... God cannot look upon sin. Whoever came up with that uh, uh, 
God looks on sin all the time. He saw my sin. He not only looked on my sin, he said, let me just build my house right next to you so that you can see me in the flesh. John says that we touched him. We lived with him. We walked with him. We ate with him. We talked with him. So I have to take that first step. That's what I'm called to do. I don't always take that first step. God help me be able to always take that, that first step because when, when I do, I'm not judging that person for what they, what they think or what their opinion is. I'm taking that step toward them in faith that maybe if they are wrong, there will be a point, there will be a time where they will come to him. Romans 5.8 says, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still stinking sinners. The reconciling person doesn't demand others to repent. We leave that up to God. We leave the spiritual status of people up to God. We're not here to lead people to ourselves, to our opinion. We're here to lead people to Jesus. We, when we take the step, what we're doing, we are intercessors to take a hold of the hand of God and the hand of man bring together. Like, the, like Isaac and Jacob's, Jacob was was given the name Jacob. He was given the name Israel. Now you will take the hand of God and the hand of man and bring them together. Think of the people who are alienated from the church today. Those people that are out there, they don't go to church anymore. Why are we upset with them? We should be burdened with them. Many of them are out there and they think, well, those people there, they have it all together. You know, those Christians, they've got it all together. They look good, they smell good, they talk good, they talk right. They've got everything in order. Or those people are so snobbish, they, they, they've always got an opinion. I asked one for a little help one time and they started preaching to me about what I ought to be doing. You've all had that happen to you at some time. There's some people you don't even want to share what your need is because you know you're going to get a sermon right away. And that's the way many times we act toward people who have, have a need rather than consoling them, rather than being empathetic with them. And there's a thing called sympathy, and then there's empathy, and then there's a, a, a kind of a new word over the last century, interpathy which means I put myself in their place like Jesus did with us. That's why he had compassion. That's why he had love. I want that kind of love. I believe that kind of love heals. One of our children one time was, was really sick. And I was praying for them. And went into the bedroom, this little, we, we called it a, uh, the bungalow, because that's what a bungalow-style house. We lived upstairs, and, and I think the rats lived downstairs. It was, it was just not a good place to live. I should be spanked right now forever, taking our family there to live there. But that's, we, we couldn't afford anything else. That's where we were, right beside an old church that we were buying. Delia decorated it with wallpaper and paint and a whole lot of love, and the place was just a wonderful place to be, and some of our great memories are there, but I remember going into that small bedroom, and it was Juliet, and I was sitting down beside her. And, and after praying for her, and she was burning up with a fever, we had no insurance, couldn't take her to the doctor, I'm sorry about that, but that's, that's the way it was. We had to trust God with all of our children in those days. We actually lived. I was looking at the statistics one day and found out, hey, we're living in poverty. Anyway, I'm just, <laughs> somebody said, how, how poor were you? Our, we're so poor, our church malice went to another church. <laughs> that's how. So I was sitting there on the edge of her bed. All of a sudden, 
this immense thing of love came over me. And I, I began to weep. Not only feeling badly for her, but badly that we lived here, that, that we were out here all alone trying to plant a church in our 20s, and we had no one. We had, we had no one. We had family that cared for us, but we had no support financially. We're out there by ourselves. That's why I have such a, an affinity for young pastors, and I want to make it easier for young pastors because I know how hard it is when you... And so we're, they're all alone, and, and in that prayer, I begin to weep. And, but, but not just weep, not weep out of sorrow, but this tremendous, I would call it a, an anointing of compassion came upon me. Next thing I know, she's standing up in the bed. She was little at that time. She's standing in the bed. She's tapping me on the shoulder and said, Daddy, I'm hungry. And I checked her body behind her ears and so forth, and she, the sweat had broken, and she, was, and she was completely healed. And I thought, I need to do this more. I need to love people. I can't preach at you. You need to be healed. You need more faith. I need to love you with the hope, with the faith, with the trust that out of that love, something will happen that God will bring you to himself. That's what we're called to be. We're called to be reconcilers. So the Bible says that the word became flesh. We cannot accomplish this mission in ourselves. Just as the word became flesh and dwelt among us, John, the first chapter, we are all that Jesus, many of will ever see. It's not excellent doctrine, not superb methodology, good programs. We need good programs. We need, we need all of this put together. These are only tools, though, to introduce people to the one. Yeah, it's like next, uh, where are you, Dr. Vince? There you are. Yeah, I, I, I speak that by faith, but we're, we're, we're not only because uh, he's been talking about that. He will be Dr. Vince before long. Anyway, we're, we're, this thing that's going to happen here next Sunday night, we're going to learn a lot of principles and everything else. L let, me, let me just share you all what I believe. I believe with all of my heart. And then maybe I'll just quit with this, but this is what I believe. I believe that in this work of redemption and in this work of reconciliation and in the work of God, we have two choices. One is to put together a plan, and to put together this plan. And then when we have it together, we say, okay, God, here's the plan. Would you just bless this now? Come, Lord, come, come. I'm presenting it. You know what? I think maybe sometimes that seems to work. But there's something else that I know works better. And so I'll give you my preference, and that is over here in the constructive stage to be able to present myself to him and say, God, I want your vision. I want your plan. And then let the dream drive the work rather than having to just constantly ask God to bless it. I know this because in Nashville, over 15 years ago, I saw the intersection of 290 and, and, and what would become the Grand Parkway, and I prayed over it, prayed over it, prayed over it, and I knew that's where we needed to be. And that's where we bought our home, and that's where we bought this property. And I'm telling you, it doesn't happen overnight. A lot of blood, sweat, and tears. Well, sweat and tears anyway. Not a whole lot of blood. <laughs> Two out of three is not bad. Anyway, it's just, it takes time for all that to come to pass. And I feel even as today, because our dream has never been to build a huge mega church. Our dream has been to do what God has called us to do. If it becomes a mega church, that's fine and that's good, but that's not what's, 
on the front burner. The front burner has always been, Lord, this is your work. If you want this to happen, make it happen. That's all I'm interested in. We're adding on to our facility right now. And if that's not kingdom-based, we don't want any part of it. But it's kingdom-based. Why? Because it's going to add to what we're trying to do with our youth and our children. And that is to raise up a, a generation where we can impart the legacy of walking by faith to them and so that they will carry on in the future. And by the way, I'm, 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 I've said this in, in case you didn't hear this, that I'm, I'm feeling pretty good and I thank God for that, but I'm planning on running all the way to the finish. Can I hear an amen, Pat? We're going to run all the way to the finish by the grace of God. We don't know what's going to happen, but that's my desire to do that anyway. So it's not, it's not the excellence of our program, but it's Jesus. It's, it's all Jesus. It's all Jesus. I think it's the re reason why events like Asbury give us hope that we see God doing a sovereign work, doing what our good intentions, what our excellent plans, our wonderful programs cannot produce. And so I'm going back to this, Dr. Vince, and that is that I know that this thing, which is going to help us even in this area here of reconciliation, it's going to help us a whole lot. It'll help us, you know, because sometimes, uh, you know, how many parents really need a whole lot of help in raising kids? Yes, you do. How many grandparents? Well, you don't need any help. You just turn it over to the parents. But anyway, all you, all you have to do is love them. I love it. Huh. God's reward for not killing your own. Uh, just uh, I love it. But this is, a, this is something that is birthed in the heart of someone. And why is it successful? Because it's birthed right there. It's birthed at the altar. It's birthed in someone's heart. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. Do you believe that? So in our hearts, God is able to birth something that is wonderful, something that is powerful. Let me, let me move along here. So there are some things, uh, we know this, that uh, everything that God wants to do will not be done until he returns. We're not setting up the kingdom of God on earth. We're not called to do that. I've, I've heard people use that terminology. He's already set up his kingdom, and he's called the church to be the representatives of his kingdom, the agents of his kingdom here on earth. So we're not setting anything up, but we are coming in line with him. And we know this, that God will transform a people into his likeness who will give direction and stewardship over a new heavens and a new earth. And we will rule and reign with him forever. Some things may not be accomplished now, but we do get a foretaste of heaven because we get the foretaste of the complete kingdom of God. Because so much that heaven is right here, heaven is rejoicing when one sinner comes to him. So what do we do with this in our community, in Northwest Houston? How are we the feet? How are we the hands of Jesus? Some say it's a Christian community. It's, it's highly Christianized. Everybody here knows Jesus. I love our community, by the way. I love Cypress. I love Tombaugh. I love Waller, Magnolia, Katie. I shouldn't start naming them now. I'm going to leave someone out. Hockley. Love it all. I love this place. Some would say that it's really not a needy community, that the work of the gospel has basically been done here. There's churches everywhere, and everybody knows about Jesus. So many choices of churches, wonderful churches. It's actually hard for startups. When we started, there were five other churches starting at the same time, and they didn't last. I'm not sure why ours lasted, but I thank God that it did. Now, they didn't make it. The options are so great. We've got beautiful buildings all around here, spacious facilities, good music. These guys are good. There's even better music around here. 
Don't go check it out. But anyway, there's better music, I'm sure. Great programs. Yet Northwest Houston is still not completely reached. What if we were more concerned about the needs of our neighbors and willing to take that step when we see a need? On the other side of town, we, Delia and I are going, making visits regularly now, helping my brother and sister-in-law. But there are undoubtedly thousands of people throughout all of Houston in their situation. What is Christ Family Church, which is you and me, what are we doing about that? Oh, thank you, Lord. I'm, I'm reconciled to you. I'm reconciled to you. What about, what about them? What about people who need a smile, who need the love of God, who need the refreshing? I like the, I like the uh, story. I, I like the show Undercover Boss. A few years ago, I, I don't know if they're doing that anymore, where CEOs of corporations go in and then disguise and they go into the companies to see how they're operating. One CEO of uh, one of these mini market um, places, like, no, it's just a mini market. I can't even remember which one it was. He goes in, and he's, uh, and he's, he's being trained to take care of things, and the lady comes to him. She's the morning manager, and she says to him, said, well, your job will be to fix, get the coffee going, and you got to keep it going. We, they come in here, and they come one right after the other, and you have to keep this full, and she goes through the whole thing, and her life, her life is right there around that coffee pot. And by the way, that covers the overhead in some of those stores. Just, just the coffee covers the overhead for the rent and everything. And so she said, this has to be done. And then she would, a new person would come. She would say, hi, hi, John. Hi, Bill. Hi, Sarah. Hi, hi, hi Jeremy. You know, she just, just, and he was astounded. And then he started making the coffee, and she interrupted him, and she politely put him aside and said, that's incorrect. You have to do it this way. And she was a rock star in what she did. Who's more important, the CEO or her? They're both important. Our CEO has come. Our boss has come. He has come to us. Now he's in our store checking us out to see what we do. And we can't do anything better than him because he was the one who took that first step. So what can we do? We do it by taking small steps. What can I do today to minister to somebody? It might be right here in this sanctuary before we leave. Somebody needs an encouraging word. So I believe in that, don't you? That's why you're not supposed to greet people at the front door with a coffee cup in your hand. But I do all the time, <laughs> so forgive me for that. But, but I pray that never the day will come in years in the future where the leadership of the church is somewhere back in a green room having their donuts and coffee while just the ordinary people come into the church where we come out, do our program, and then we slip off to the car lest we be touched by someone with lesser capability or calling because we're all called to this. And we're called to brokenness. I, I will close with that. God says to this one, do I look to that one who has a broken and a contrite spirit? That's the person that I will look to. I regain my first love by being broken in his presence. I just say, and my prayer is, God, would you break us and make us what you want us to be? Cause us not only to be the people that rejoice in the reconciliation, but, Lord, today cause us to be reconcilers, to be the ones who walk in in love to our neighbor. Do what we cannot do on our own. Open doors that we cannot open on our own. 
give strength and peace and power to all of your children. We give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name. Lord, if there's somebody that does not know you, bring them to yourself today, we pray. We just release right now uh, this time for those who want more of you to come to you, those who do not know you to come to you. May you bless them. May you encourage and strengthen them. We give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody stand together. We're going to go for a moment of worship. We have some people over here that will pray with you if you want special prayer in the prayer room as we dismiss in a few minutes. I'll let Pastor Juliet uh, lead us out. I'll be in the, uh, in the hallway there as, as we leave today. But let's come with this. Which song are you going to sing? Yeah. Wonderful song. Let's worship the Lord a few minutes and then be